issues with it. All right. I got you, got it. Okay. <laughs> I think we should acknowledge the board. Um, we're, going to, we're going to the podium to have the board. So. Yeah. Great idea. Thank you for being on the ball. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and it's one minute to 10. Um, yeah, this was just not working where it was working earlier. Uh, I just I got I was on first too. Maybe you might have to click on the screen. I, like on Zoom? No, no, it's gonna be this, yeah. and because it's it's actually being controlled up there. We're sharing the screen. So I can let them know when to stop. Because one, I don't want to go too bad. Yeah, you could you can just uh, hit this and keep going to the next slide. Is that what you're saying? That works. Okay, so your slide's already here. Yeah, but I've got three videos embedded in the slide. Oh, so they yes, be which they were the embedded. Yeah, so I have them. So you just want to stop from halfway through? The last one after I'll know when to stop, but I can hit the next Yeah, one. if you just hit the arrow, it will just move forward. Perfect. So this is not <laughs> you got oh, the screen now. I think it was right. oh, no. Yep. We've done a lot. We're good. Yep. Yeah, if you still. click on, if you like click on the so screen, screen on my set up there, <laughs> then it won't work. Okay, thank you. Or then what? Ready to get started? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Hi. Good morning. All right. I am Jay Sanders, serving on the 2022 GMAR Board of Directors and the GMAR Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And I'm honored to serve today as today's MC. I'd like to have all of GMAR's Board of Directors who are here to stand and be recognized. They are the leadership of the Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors. We appreciate your support. We also have in our audience our immediate past Michigan Realtors president. Let us welcome Etoile Libet and her husband, Dave. A few housekeeping uh, issues that we'd like to address early on. Welcome to our virtual participants. We would ask that you please put yourself on mute and welcome to our event virtual participants. Also, in-person participants, would you take a moment to put your cell phones on vibrate or turn them off? If your cell phone rings during this presentation, we will kindly accept and graciously accept a $5 donation to our pack. And, and finally, our restrooms are outside of the room and to your right. If you are in the hallway, please, wel you're welcome to come in and be seated. We have more than 30 of 300 people joining us today, both in person and virtually. And again, welcome to our program, the Protecting the Many Colors of Home Ownership Conference. We have an incredible line up of speakers today. And first, before I introduce our panelists, I would like to introduce our event sponsors today. We have an amazing representative from Chase to speak on what we are currently doing in our communities on racial equality, minority lending, and home buyer grants. At this time, I am pleased to introduce Stacy Hunter, the community manager for Chase Bank. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. Good morning and thank you. What an honor to be here. As she mentioned, my name is Stacy Hunter. I'm with Chase Bank. I'm one of the community managers um, that serves this metropolitan area. And what an honor to be a sponsor. In honor of the many colors, I took off my blue and wore my red today. Is that okay? <laughs> so 
So let me tell you a little bit about our racial equity commitment. Chase is evolving um, how we do business as a whole. We're diving, we're diving deeper into economic inclusion so every community in the US can have opportunity to thrive. We've committed over $30 billion to Black, Hispanic, and Latino communities providing opportunities in sustainable home ownership, affordable lending, small business, financial health, and equal access to banking so every community can receive the financial services they need. Home ownership is critical. It's critical to, to building and protecting generational wealth in America, to closing the racial wealth gap. It's, the only, it's only one of the biggest financial investments a person can make in their lifetime, and it can help gain economic stability. From the racial equity commitment, Chase Home Lending is responsible for advancing home ownership among 60,000 Black and Latino Hispanic customers, totaling 12 billion in responsible lending. That's 4 billion to refinance and 8 billion to purchase. At the heart of the work is the lesson that the racial wealth gap through homeownership, we are committed to hiring diverse talent in our communities, being actively present to meet the customer's needs where they, where they are, deepening the local and partnerships and relationships, expanding our programs to increase access to credit financing and capital, prioritizing community outreach and advocating for comprehensive housing policy reform. On my slide here, you'll see some of the results that we've had so far. Chase is committed to promoting increased diversity in the appraisal industry. We are a key partner in the appraisal diversity initiative, which includes $3 million in grants that will go towards the appraisal institute to attract new people to, in the field to help train and overcome common barriers to entry in the foster diversity. Our, commercial, our customer and our realtor experience and relationship we're dedicated to deepening the relationship and expanding our presence through the local coverage of home lending advisors and new community lending advisors. Community home lending advisors are newly developed. It's a new role that Chase has designed to be the local, to be located in the minority and the low income moderate areas. These individuals are experts in the local housing and down payment assistance. Since late 2020, Chase has hired more than 100 home lending advisors nationwide and will continue to expand. I will later introduce our Michigan home lenders here that are on the ground. Our range of products and services support clients and customers across the income spectrum. To help address two of the biggest barriers to affordable lending, Chase has doubled its homeowner grant program to $5,000 to help more customers with closing costs and down payment assistance when buying a home. It's in, over more, it's, it's in, in more than 6,700 minority communities nationwide. And we still offer the 2,500 home buyer grant for low to moderate income families. Now, our partnership with you, our relationship with the realtors. Chase Agent Express harnesses the power and the reach of the firm to better connect real estate agents, agents with Chase's 60 million, 60 million households and grow their business. Chase Agent Express provides next-gen technology and tools to elevate your community and marketing and foster meaningful relationships. As a community manager in the city of Detroit, it is my responsibility to partner with my home lenders to make sure that when the client gets to them, they're ready. We teach them savings, we teach them budgeting, we teach them credit, and then our, home, our, our lenders teach them home buyer workshops. So they have virtual workshops, they have face-to-face -face workshops, and that is what we're doing in, this, in the community. This is our community team. Ken Corley is our community lending manager. I am sitting in for him today. We have Joe Scoza, he's our senior lending manager. Elder Al Thomas, he's our business development manager. Gail Taylor and I are the only two community manager in Detroit that met the services the metropolitan area. And then I would like for you after this meeting, make sure you connect with our CHLAs. We have Anthony Miller, if you can stand up when I call your name. We have Anthony Miller. We have Nicolette Rankin. We have Tina Hayden Harris, we have Ken Strickland, and we have Edward Sanders. So make sure before you leave here today that you connect with these lenders that are doing the work in the community, on the ground, impacting the lives that need the work the most. So we thank you for this time. We thank you for the honor, the honor of sponsoring such a great event. And I look forward to hearing from all of you later. Let's give Stacey Hunter another round of applause. Thank you so much, Chase Bank, 
for your commitment to racial equality and lending. And Stacy, thank you for coming today and sharing that great information. I now would like to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. We have an amazing rock star team of panelists today, starting with Brian Green, Vice President of Policy Advocacy for the National Association of Realtors. Welcome, Brian. Lori Brenner. Lori Binner, Associate Vice President of Programs, National Fair Housing. Ryan Wayant, CEO of the LGBTQ Plus Real Estate Alliance. And Steve Tom Kowiak, Executive Director of Fair Housing Center, each of Metropolitan Detroit. Each of our speakers will have the opportunity to update you on their expertise. And after all of the speakers are finished, we will open it up for Q&A. Our awesome committee members, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for GMAR, will be picking up index cards. Does everyone have an index card? If you, have, if you don't have one and would like one, please just raise your hand and someone will be sure. Can we take care of these participants who would like index cards? Thank you. The committee members, keep your hands up and we'll make sure you get a card. And the committee members, will be collecting your cards toward the end of our presentation. Please don't forget to write down your questions and give it to one of our committee members. Our first panelist will be Brian Green. Again, Brian is the Vice President of Polit Policy Advocacy at the National Association of Realtors, where he oversees all legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the association's 1.5 million members. Brian joined NAR in November, 2019, and he spent his first year at NAR raising the association's profile in Washington, DC. Brian, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, well, it's great to be back in Troy. Um, and I've been to Detroit many times, but I've also been to Troy. In fact, uh, uh, checking into my hotel last night, I'm pretty sure I've been to this very hotel that I'm staying in. Um, I came out here um, from Washington in 2005 uh, with my girlfriend, now my wife, um, to see Paul McCartney at the palace. <laughs> uh, you know, in 2005, I was like, oh my God, like we, uh, Paul McCartney had played Washington and, and we, we didn't go. We were out to dinner with all the people going to see him. And we said, you know, we really should catch him. He may not be touring much longer. And so we actually bought tickets on Craigslist and decided to fly out to Detroit, drive up uh, to Auburn Hills uh, to see Paul McCartney play. Great, great show. Um, and what was fascinating is during the show, he um, uh, took out an acoustic guitar and he pointed and he had a Detroit Red Wings sticker on the acoustic guitar. Uh, and apparently he's had that sticker on that guitar since 1976. Someone gave that to him uh, during a Detroit show and said, you know, hey, you're playing, you know, your band's name is Wings, so you need a Red Wings sticker. And so he's, he's, he's put that on his guitar and he's kept it on there ever since. It's the same guitar that he played um, on the Ed Sullivan show, played yesterday with. And so, yeah, he played yesterday in the show and he played Blackbird, which one of, was one of my favorite Beatles songs, which incidentally uh, was recorded in 1968, same year. Fair Housing Act was passed and uh, is about civil rights. It's about uh, rising up and meeting the challenge of civil rights. Uh, so I wanna talk to you about the challenge that remains for us. Um, you know, you are leaders and your state has uh, been a leader 
in fair housing. In fact, I want to uh, acknowledge that your governor during the 1960s, George Romney, uh, was and probably still is one of the most unheralded champions for civil rights in our country. Uh, while he was governor, George Romney uh, sought to pass a civil rights law here in Michigan, faced a lot of opposition. Uh, and then when Nixon was elected, uh, Nixon made George Romney the first, oh, sorry, the, the secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the first secretary uh, to enforce the Fair Housing Act, which became effective uh, in January of 1969, uh, just as the, the Nixon administration was starting. So he really uh, came out of the gate rather aggressively in enforcing this law. I wanna say I'm, I'm a beneficiary of it too. Um, the very first case that was filed under the Fair Housing Act was filed um, against a cooperative development in Washington, DC called the Ontario Owners. Um, an African-American woman sought to buy a cooperative in this building in the Adams Morgan section of Washington, DC, uh, and they conspired to deny her. And later it came out you know, that they were explicitly trying to keep the place white. Um, but that was the very first case, uh, John Mitchell filed it um, uh, in US District Court. Uh, and this was when George Romney was Secretary of HUD. I say it's, uh, I'm a beneficiary in the sense that uh, I lived in that building in the 1990s to uh, about 2002 when I bought a house. Um, and, uh, you know, it was funny to move into that building and tell people that I worked at HUD enforcing the Fair Housing Act. And they're like, oh, you know, we were the first uh, defendants <laughs> in a fair housing. They're like, welcome. <laughs> um, and so by that time, there were, there were more African-Americans who were living there. Malcolm Gladwell lived there for a short while as well. Um, Modestly integrated, um, but still not very integrated. Uh, so, um, so yeah. So very first act, uh, very first case filed, and Romney was rather aggressive in enforcing this new law, and he understood from his experiences in Michigan that the enforcement of the law was about more than simply bringing these individual cases. Um, you had to do that. You had to make the case law. You had to pursue the remedies for individuals who had experienced discrimination. But he also recognized that you had uh, full, you had entire communities that uh, were segregated, and that was structural. That you had to figure out how to deal with that because uh, that was, in, in his view, the biggest problem. Um, that we're facing in the country. And he knew the history. He knew the history in Michigan. He knew that uh, initially many of these uh, all white communities were created through violence. And uh, when I came up to Detroit in, in 2005 to see that show, my wife and I, we also went um, to visit the home that is the subject of a, of a book called um, The Ark of Justice. Anyone know that book by Kevin Boyle? Uh, but it's, it's about an African-American doctor uh, named Ocean Sweet, who, uh, like several African-American doctors, you know, had the money and the desire to buy a big house, uh, which were in these white areas. They African-Americans were segregated in what they called then Black Bottom. And uh, Ocean Sweet had seen the example of, of uh, African-Americans before him who sought to buy homes and were chased out by mobs, uh, literally another doctor was carried out of his house by a mob uh, and his stuff put on the street. And so Ocean Suite feared that, um, but he was determined and uh, bought this house, uh, I wanna say corner of Charlevoix and Garland, um, memory serves. And um, uh, hold up, he holed up in the house with uh, his brothers because he knew uh, a mob would come and the mob came and they began pelting rocks at the house uh, when I say a mob, I'm talking about 700 people or more. Uh, and uh, the men inside, fearing for their lives, they had guns. And uh, when uh, the rocks rained down and they became fearful that people would storm the house, one of the men in the house shot out of the house uh, and it killed someone. And the police promptly arrested everyone in the house and tried them all for murder. Um, 
Clarence Darrow, you've heard of him. Uh, he came to Detroit uh, to defend this case and the NAACP got very involved. But this was the history uh, and Romney knew this history uh, and he knew that uh, when African-Americans did uh, seize the opportunity to move into areas, you also saw white flight and that in these new suburban communities to, to which whites had fled, uh, they put up other barriers, sometimes physical, but also um, using the law, using zoning uh, to restrict who could live in that neighborhood, uh, prohibiting, say, multi-unit developments that may be affordable, that might uh, lead to racial integration, uh, requiring setbacks and minimum lot sizes in order to limit uh, the number of houses and the affordability of houses and therefore who could move in. So Romney understood that. And in fact, he, had a, uh, he was quoted as saying that economic and social distance um, is increased by this racial distance, that he recognized the potential long-term um, economic and social effects of such segregation. Um, but he also understood that uh, economic and social distance uh, is also increased by racial distance that um, housing production was going to be very important to uh, creating a more inclusive society, more inclusive communities. And so his other big effort was something called Operation Breakthrough, which really doesn't get a lot of attention today. But um, at HUD, he pushed for um, more um, affordable housing design, more modular structures, more mass production of housing, because he recognized that we needed to make housing more affordable uh, to serve more Americans. And they actually create, they all chose nine sites around the country where they did successfully produce um, on a large scale, some modular housing uh, that was mixed income and integrated. But all of this was too much uh, for Richard Nixon. And he was getting lots of pushback in communities. Uh, Romney actually made uh, his home, Michigan, sort of the center of some of these efforts. Uh, Warren, Michigan was one of the places where uh, he focused attention and people pushed back vigorously. And it was too much for Nixon and pretty much um, the end of Romney's political career uh, that he had decided to take on racial segregation in the United States. Uh, one academic described Romney's efforts as the most sincerely devised uh, and poorly executed plans because he did not anticipate the politics involved and uh, the lack of readiness of the American people. But uh, Romney even himself said, you know, you know, we don't have time to wait for nature to run its course. Uh, he suspected that these things were not going to come of themselves in time. And I suppose you could say he was uh, ahead of his time that uh, he knew that this would take lots of leadership, uh, uh, lots of um, challenge. Um, so the question is whether we're ready for these things today. Um, no doubt, uh, we know we still have housing discrimination in our country. Um, we do surveys of our membership and you would think that our membership uh, of realtors recognize this, but, uh, I'm sometimes surprised. We surveyed 1.5 million uh, members to ask them to what extent they think discrimination still persists today. Uh, and when asked, still 57% of our membership uh, say that they either have not witnessed discrimination or that they don't believe that it currently exists. Now, we didn't ask, you know, is it widespread? Is it endemic? Just ask, does it exist? And 57% said no, like not one instance of discrimination. So we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, now, I think many of you heard about this New York Newsday story a couple of years ago that showed widespread discrimination out of Long Island. Uh, interestingly, I was reading through old copies of the New York Times, 1962, and I was reading about um, the same kind of survey done back then and the same high levels of discrimination uh, back then. And so um, 
over, what is that, over 50 years later, uh, seeing these high levels of discrimination. New York Newsday, when they did this testing out on Long Island, where they sent uh, African-American testers and Hispanic testers and Asian testers, found that those groups experienced discrimination 49% uh, of the time, 39% of the time, and 19% of the time, respectively. Um, very high rates of uh, differences in treatment when they went uh, to look at housing. So that we have to handle. We have to aggressively address that at the at minimum. As realtors, we have to recognize that it happens. Uh, we've done these surveys since New York Newsday came out. And so if you had even read that story or seen one of the videos about it, you would have to answer that question differently. So we have some resistance and even just acknowledging that the problem exists. But even if we were to address that, uh, if we were to address all discrimination that occurs right now in the real estate market, we'd still have a problem because of this legacy. This legacy has created great inequality. It's very difficult for people um, because of this history um, to compete on equal terms in the housing market. Uh, we do another uh, study um, called the, um, the Buyers and Sellers Snapshot, where we look, look at who's buying um, and selling. Um, and in terms of uh, home buyers this past year, African Americans, for example, represent only 5% of home buyers, even though they represent 13% of the population. And then when we drill down to look at, well, what's the profile of those home buyers, we find that. <clears throat> Um, those home buyers actually have higher degrees of education than white home buyers. Uh, they tend to, um, there's a higher level of, of uh, African American home buyers who have graduate degrees, people who are doctors or lawyers who are uh, MBAs uh, compared to whites. And the main reason um, is because there isn't a history of equity. And so African-Americans have to earn higher incomes in order to buy homes. If you look at um, where people get their down payment from, whites were more than twice as likely as African-Americans uh, to, to have gotten their down payment from the sale of a previous home. So if there has not been this history of home ownership, there isn't this equity to tap. Um, and not only that, that equity is not there to tap for education. African-Americans are twice as likely uh, to have student loan debt and significantly more. So people are digging themselves in these holes trying to get housing. They're getting ahead, I suppose, but they are, um, you know, they, they don't have those resources. They're going into debt with, with student loans. Uh, African-Americans and Hispanics are twice as likely to tap into their retirement in order to find that, find that down payment for the home. So this is having a compound effect on communities, not to mention the impact that has on credit because everything costs the same for all of us, but if you have less income, you're going to be more burdened trying to afford those things that you need or that everyone has. So all of this, um, all of these issues, we have to try to address. Um, NAR, we're partnering with groups like National Fair Housing Alliance and others, National uh, Urban League, uh, Mortgage Bankers Association. We're part of something called the Black Home Ownership Collaborative that is looking at this very wide home ownership gap between African Americans and whites and trying to find ways to close it. Our goal is to have uh, 3 million um, um, homeowners by uh, the year 2030. We call it three by 30. And uh, advocating for steps we can take to increase this. Uh, some of the things we're looking at and have advocated for uh, to Congress are down payment assistance, um, more steps to address um, how people have credit worthiness that's not being reflected in credit reports. In, in other words, like you know, rent payments, utility payments, there are people who are meeting these large obligations that the, the credit reporting bur bureaus currently don't acknowledge. Fannie Mae has made steps to, to recognize that. Um, we're advocating things like the special purpose credit programs. Um, the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act allow you, uh, allow lenders, we have you know, lending representation here, to create programs uh, designed for groups that have been historically underserved. Uh, 
And that now is getting a lot of currency and people are thinking we need to do this. We need to find um, more dramatic steps to intervene and help catch up. And then finally, if you're successful and you actually buy a house or have a history of home ownership, uh, not all home ownership, unfortunately, is equal. Uh, there have been lots of um, stories about appraisal bias, where you know people have comparable homes uh, and aren't seeing them appreciate uh, the same rate, or at least not seeing appraisers value them at the same rate. So that is a big issue too. And in some cases, uh, they found with say with biracial couples that depending on who was home, uh, the uh, appraisal was greatly different, sometimes as much as 50% different. So uh, the administration is taking on that issue because you know if you realize the American dream, uh, it shouldn't be a leaky bucket. You should realize you know, what you're entitled to. So all of those are important. But finally, I wanna say that um, we recognize that housing production is key too. And Romney recognized that as well all those years ago that um, we have a housing shortage in this country, which is making housing unaffordable to many. We are somewhere between 5.5 million and 6.8 million units short. That's decades short from where we ought to be. Uh, and because of that, um, housing is, become, is becoming, uh, home ownership is, is go, um, going far out of the reach of many, many Americans, but even more acutely, uh, people of color. And so we need to build. We need to find ways to put, get more units out there, more units on the market, um, and even to repurpose some of the, un, the unused commercial buildings that are out there. We have vacant malls, we have vacant um, office spaces, vacant hotels, even vacant schools with a, a hundred year low in birth rates. All, a lot of these um, facilities can be converted for, for residential housing, but we have, to, we have to address it, we have to address it fast because um, housing is becoming unaffordable to, to many. We really need something of a Marshall Plan to address these things. Uh, and then of course we need zoning reform in our communities because you have to have somewhere to build. And so we have to begin looking at this differently and looking at how are we going to meet the needs of the future. And when we meet these needs, we will actually be able to better uh, address these issues of diversity and inclusivity as well. And so all of those things uh, as Romney recognized go together. So in some sense, you, you really created the roadmap here in Michigan, you create, create great cars, you got to create the roads to go with it. Um, and so strong enforcement of the act, uh, you know, from 1969 on, we, we can do a better job. As I said, uh, Romney was the most aggressive. Uh, HUD has had its ups and downs. I worked there for much of it. Um, but, um, we, you know, they work for us and we have to demand a stronger enforcement of the law. I'm pleased to see that uh, HUD is also aggressively enforcing the law now on behalf of LGBTQ persons, even though we don't have um, uh, federal legislation that prohibits such discrimination, HUD has interpreted uh, a recent Supreme Court decision to provide um, to provide uh, coverage under gender discrimination. And I'm hoping Ryan's gonna talk a little bit about that too, but th that, um, that is an important development in HUD's enforcement of the law, but we need more testing, we need more systemic enforcement. And so that's gonna make a big difference um, to address all of those structural issues. And as I said, we need the housing production really, because without housing, uh, everything's off the table. So we need to be pushing in our communities uh, for solutions to the housing shortage. So I'm confident that folks in Michigan can show that leadership, can rise to the challenge. You can all do it. And I just think uh, you've been waiting for this moment to arise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate your explanation about how the shortage of housing is impacting housing affordability. If you have questions about Brian's presentation, please hold them until the end and they will be asked during our question and answer period. 
give Brian another round of applause. Our next speaker is the Associate Vice President of Programs for the National Fair Housing Alliance, NFHA. Lori Benner is responsible for developing, implementing, managing, and evaluating innovative national programs designed to advance research programs and policies that provide equitable access to home ownership, housing, economic, and other opportunities. Let's give a warm welcome to Lori Benner. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here in front of people. Uh, I know we have a, a number of folks joining us on Zoom, but it's nice to be getting back to, uh, to this type of uh, presentation environment. Less excited about having to wear pants and shoes, but you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> so NAFA, National Fair Housing Alliance, is a 34 year old civil rights nonprofit organization. It's the only organization, national organization, dedicated to eliminating discrimination in housing. And we endeavor to do that through education, outreach, public policy and advocacy efforts, housing and community development, consulting and investigation and enforcement, which yes, sometimes leads to litigation. We are also a member organization. We have fair housing centers such as um, Steve's organization as our members all across the US. And so when we tend to look less at individual instances of discrimination or reports of discrimination, and we refer those to our member organizations, um, we tend to look at the big systemic issues to help uh, advance our mission. Where you live matters. So in the real estate industry, we tend to think of fair housing through a strictly discrimination focused lens. But at NAFA, we look at it as a broader civil rights issue. Um, where you live determines your access to key amenities. It determines your opportunities or lack of opportunities. NAFA did a study in partnership with Zillow a couple years ago, uh, looking at 10 different cities at health-related and financial-related uh, amenities. And you would not be shocked to find that there are huge, huge disparities. Communities of color lack access to basic financial and health-related um, amenities. There is a dearth of mainstream financial institutions in communities of color, and we'll talk about some of those, what those impacts lead to. But a couple key findings um, that I thought were interesting is in the Detroit region for Latino neighborhoods, they have 75% fewer fitness amenities and 93% fewer health amenities than in neighborhoods, um, in white neighborhoods. So that report can be found on our website if you want to read more about it, and I can provide, um, provide links to, to the information for you. Now, a lot of the information that we work on at NAFA really stems from the disparities. The um, Black-white home ownership gap right now is about 30 percentage points, and it's higher than when the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. So Brian mentioned uh, the Black Home Ownership Collaborative. We work in partnership with all of those organizations to hope to achieve that 3 million net new Black homeowners. And we also hope to achieve a 50% Latino homeownership rate, which I think we're pretty close to that right now. So again, who is using these alternative financial services? In communities of color, they tend to have um, check cashing stores, payday lenders, pawn shops, as opposed to bank branches. And so what this, uh, these lack of amenities does is it impacts FICO scores, credit scores. And 
across the US, only about 25% of black individuals have a FICO score over 700. That's even less here in Detroit, it's about 14%. But this chart here, what really strikes me more so than those credit score disparities is the, uh-oh, somebody has money to RPAC, I think. <laughs> Um, the, the blue section of this chart here, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe, uh-oh, is this your purse here? Ooh. <laughs> you, you want me to, uh, just get the wallet right out and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that, I didn't mean to call you out there. Um, <laughs> so what really strikes me on this chart is, is the blue part, the, those blue bars, those are people who are missing FICO scores. So those are, those are folks who, who just don't have, you know, their credit invisible, they don't have, it's not that they have poor credit, they just don't have credit. Um, you know, here in Detroit, it's, it's 37%, and that's a huge number. And so that the lack of traditional mainstream bank branches um, is, a, is, you know, directly correlated to that. So I'll touch on a few hot topics uh, that NAFA is working on. One is our tech equity initiative, which is a, a growing body of work. We have a whole team of data scientists and uh, computer computer nerds, I like to call them, who, uh, who really are digging into these issues in a way that I can't even really honestly pretend to understand. Um, they're looking at removing bias in computer algorithms, machine learning, um, anything having to do with these, with these automated systems that have impacts not only in the housing realm, such as mortgage lending, decision-making, um, rental um, acceptance for, for people who are applying, for rent, but insurance as well. Um, it also has impacts on health decision making, um, employment. So these computer algorithms touch every single area of our lives. And so it's hard to think how can a computer be biased? You know, to me, it's hard to understand. But one of the good examples they gave me was um, in terms of credit. So think about who has had the most access to credit in this country. White people, right? So there's some inherent bias built into the foundational data that underlies, um, you know, the, the credit scores and these in these financial systems. Uh, Fannie Mae settlement. We recently settled a lawsuit against Fannie Mae. It was one of the largest in the history of the Fair Housing Act. Fifty-three million dollars for their treatment of REO properties post 2008. So what happened was, and this probably doesn't surprise any of you here, that in communities of color, they left the houses to just crumble. They didn't maintain the lawns, they didn't maintain the exteriors. So the houses crumbled apart, looked terrible, had an impact on the entire neighborhood, the entire community, but they kept up the houses in the white communities. So that disparity is where that action came from. We also have um, litigation pending against Bank of America and Deutsche Bank for those same um, for those same issues. And so what that means, that settlement money, those funds will get deployed back into the communities that were harmed. And there's, a, there's an array of ways that they can be used, um, such as for housing, counseling, you know, home buyer education, for down payment assistance, for um, rehabilitation and rehab work. So a lot of the um, programs that we see, these, these great uh, programs where in, funds are being invested into communities are not always philanthropic. A lot of times they come from bad behavior um, that these institutions um, unfortunately are engaging in, and they're essentially being forced to, to reinvest in the communities that they've harmed. Um, redlining toolkit. Just last week, we released a redlining toolkit, which is designed to help organizations look at HMDA, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, um, to see if financial institutions may be engaging in some modern day redlining or engaging in, um, in, in lending practices that are unfair in a particular geography.
appraisal bias. Brian mentioned uh, the appraisal bias issue right now. We worked with some partners and developed a, a, a big report that really kind of cracked open the appraisal and appraiser systems and found that they are, well, first of all, appraisers as a whole are 97% white. So there's a huge lack of representation in the appraisal industry, but the industry is this very insulated group where they tend to make their own rules, enforce their own rules to the extent that any rules actually get enforced. Um, and so we made a, a variety of recommendations as to how uh, the appraisal Institute and the appraisal system can be changed to help shore up some of those inequities. Um, the, the fair housing education that the appraisers get was found to be woefully inadequate and in some cases wrong. So that was another recommendation that we made. Um, Brian touched on special purpose credit programs. We are working in partnership with the Mortgage Bankers Association and Homeownership Council of America to develop a toolkit, which will be a step-by-step -step guide for lenders to create their own special purpose credit program. So it's, it's an exciting opportunity, one that um, has been allowed, has been permitted since 1974 and hasn't been used but we're very, very hopeful. In fact, um, we have uh, co colleagues, friends here from Chase and Chase does operate a special purpose credit program. I believe it's in the Chicago area. Um, now that special purpose, purpose credit program is geographically based as opposed to racially explicit. Um, and so we're, we're really hoping that more lending institutions will have programs that are racially explicit because that's really the most direct way um, to help make a difference in this, in these homeownership gaps. Uh, first generation down payment assistance, we helped craft a portion of the, I don't know, I guess call it what now, defunct Build Back Better Act, I don't know. Um, and hoping uh, for, I think it was $10 billion in first generation down payment assistance. And while that is not a racially explicit um, program, Statistically speaking, first generation home buyers tend to be people of color. And so that was a way to direct funds um, in, the, in the right direction. So the program that I am managing for NAFA is called Keys Unlock Dreams. And Keys Unlock Dreams is a three year, 10 city initiative. And the overarching goal is to help close the racial wealth and home ownership gaps. And yes, Detroit is one of our cities. And so we partnered with the Urban Institute and did a housing kind of a state of housing in Detroit uh, report. And that looked at household characteristics, neighborhood segregation, housing cost burden um, for both homeowners and renters, mortgage denial rates, credit scores, mortgage readiness, housing supply. So all of those um, issues surrounding housing in not only the city of Detroit, but the Detroit metropolitan area. And a, a few of the um, solutions or, or the challenges that were highlighted, again, will be no surprise to you. The, the property taxes, I know that's, that's a big um, issue that's in the news right now. Uh, pandemic related impacts such as people of color being behind on housing payments, again, both mortgage and rent payments. Um, and the older housing stock. There's an overarching across the US big problem with supply, but some areas have, you know, they have decent housing stock. It's just not in, in it's older, it's, it's deteriorating. It's not in a, in a place where um, it can be, people can just move right in. And those types of rehabs um, are very, very expensive. And there's a lack of resources for people to be able to do that type of work. Um, but again, the, the overarching goal is to help close the racial wealth and homeownership gaps. We're also looking at the big systemic issues. We want to make sure that the recovery from the COVID pandemic is done equitably, because as we know, um, those resources are often not uh, deployed into communities of color the same way that they are into white communities. Um, so, and partnership is another big part of it. Partnership with organizations such as all of my colleagues up here, partners, um, you know, with all of you here, because as a national organization, we can't be all of the places and know all of the things. And so we rely on those partnerships to hear about the unique 
um, opportunities and challenges in each area and how we might be able to partner to bring resources to the area. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Lori Benner. Let me first say ap apology to you for my phone ringing and I will donate my $15 to RPAC. Lori, I appreciate you. I'm so glad you're here today. And I really learned a lot about how uh, your Keys Unlock Dreams program. And as a third generation Detroiter, I'm happy that Detroit is included in that. Let's give Lori another round of applause. Our next speaker is Ryan Wayant, CEO of the LGBTQ plus community, Real Estate Alliance. Ryan is passionate about people. He's passionate about his coworkers and his immediate circle, the people who surround him. He identifies as an agent for an advocate of diversity, equity and inclusion, and is passionate about organizational change and development. As a veteran mortgage lender, Ryan officially became the CEO of the LGBTQ plus Real Estate Alliance on June 23rd, 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, ahead of the organization's public launch. Let's give a big warm round of applause and welcome Ryan Wayant. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, it is delightful to be here. This is my first trip to this part of the state. And I think I made the comment over dinner last night. It's actually quite charming. I, I hail out of the Midwest as well. I'm from the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Um, I live in the better of the two, St. Paul, uh, not Minneapolis, but it was bizarre flying an hour here, but losing an hour with a time zone change. So I'm a little rusty this morning, bear with me. Um, there's a pointer up here, fabulous. And it works. Um, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, as, as I was introduced, our organization started right in the middle of a pandemic. And I gotta tell you, if you wanna try something new in life, start a minority nonprofit in the middle of a pandemic that the country's seen for the first time. It was, uh, it was quite the challenge, but it has yielded incredible results and I'm incredibly grateful to be here representing our organization and our community in real estate today. Um, as you can see, I am not a realtor. However, I do honor the longstanding tradition of using a photo that's 10 years old. Um, so, <laughs> Bear with me on that. I apologize. Hopefully we'll get some new headshots soon. Um, a little bit about the Alliance. We were founded, uh, as I said, in the, the middle of a pandemic, and it really, it was an accident. It was a complete accident. Um, it came from a necessity to continue the energy, the great energy um, that the LGBTQ community had really built and cultivated over the last 13 years. The organization that was formally in place and partnered with the NAR ceased to exist. Um, and there was a need to continue that momentum. NAR, the National Association, had granted our community a seat at the table, along with our um, what we call our sister organizations, uh, NAREB, NAREB, and ARIA, if, if you're familiar with any of those diverse segment organizations. Um, so the momentum was there, the energy were, was there, and, and the folks uh, who make up our community in real estate realized that we didn't have time to slow down or lose that. So. We formed, and over the course of the past uh, 18 months, we have grown from, from zero members when we opened to the public on October 1st, 2020, to just shy of, of 2,200 members today. Um, so it's been uh, momentous growth. It's been very exciting for us um, from both a leadership and a staff perspective. We are all across the country. We're in Puerto Rico. We're hoping for some expansion in Guam. I'm gonna talk to Lori about that. Um, and our, our mission is really focused on four pillars, education, advocacy, business development, because everyone wants ROI, right? You're not going to stay with us if you're not getting something out of your membership, kind of like your gym membership that you probably haven't used in two years. Um, and uh, philanthropy, 
we are a C6 organization under the IRS. That means we're a member organization, just like your association is, or the National Association. We are not a charity, but we do give money to charities in our space that do a much better job um, at facilitating the way that that money is, is divvied out. So those are the four things that, that we focus on at the Alliance. Our home ownership rate today in the LGBTQ community in America is, is about 50%, 49.8% significantly lower than the general home ownership rate of 65% and the non-Hispanic white home ownership rate of 74% in this country. So we have some work to do. Um, why am I here today? Well, I'm here because our community represents the many colors of housing. We are a microchasm of society at large. Within our diverse segment, we have all ethnic and racial diversities. We've got veterans and civilians all kinds of faiths and religious beliefs, um, every political orientation you could ever imagine. Um, and, and we're proud of that. And that's really what makes us a community under the LGBTQ flag. I like to say that those colors, while they're celebratory, also represent everyone that belongs to the community uh, in some way, shape or form. So before I, and this is, you know, I love that we're at a Michigan State facility. There's going to be a lot of facts and figures in here. I believe that's the best way to convey information. It sticks with folks. I certainly can answer questions at the end. Um, but some just basic things that I want to review um, before we get too far into my organization and what I do. Um, a couple of things about the community. You already know or love someone in the community. Whether you know that or not is a different story. And I say that because between Gallup and the Human Rights Campaign, surveys have shown over the last five years that about 10% of the American population identifies as LGBTQ+. That number doesn't seem like a lot, but we're going to go over why that's important a little bit later in the presentation. Gallup found that uh, a few years ago it was about 7.1%. And within that, the intersectionality of our community um, is absolutely fascinating. 57% of our community identifies as bisexual. And you don't hear that because predominantly the folks that have the loudest voice are middle-aged white gay men, which again is very representative of society at large. Um, so there is a problem within our own community of representation that we're actively working on and addressing every single day. Every time I get the opportunity to speak to folks uh, inside and outside our community, or, or any of our leaders for that matter, it's important that we call these things out because our community, like every other community, is not perfect, and it's constantly a work of progress. A fascinating set of statistics came out of Gallup uh, late last year. 20% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ. So I just want you to look at those numbers for a second and, and, and absorb that. If you look at the traditionalist generation, it's less than 1% of folks who identify openly. Now, folks, I maintain that we're not just sprouting like daisies across America. I don't think someone's waking up one day and saying, well, geez, this is kind of trendy. I'm gay today. <laughs> I think this is a direct representation of acceptance in America, which is largely driven through social and corporate platforms, in my opinion. Um, so change is good, change is painful, and change takes time, but the evolution is there. And for all of you in the crowd that work with clients, which I would imagine is probably the majority of you, these are good statistics to know because Gen Z is now graduating college as of this weekend. Um, so these folks are going to be in the marketplace very soon looking for opportunities to own homes. Why does that matter? Well, our good friends at the National Association of Realtors um, recently reported numbers saying that about 11% of NAR members do not identify as straight uh, or heterosexual. A lot of folks just chose not to, uh, not to answer how they responded, or I beg your pardon, how they represent, and, and you can draw your own conclusions on what that number stands for. Um, at the Alliance, we believe that's folks who probably aren't openly out. Um, as I said, Gallup, and let me just back up here a second. I refer to some independent sources here, right? NAR, Gallup, we'll talk about the Williams Institute. I do that because there's a severe lack of data about the LGBTQ community in America. It is not a protected class, whether you don't realize that or not, we'll, we'll also address that. 
Um, but the data that we do have comes from independent sources because the United States government and the census do not measure metrics within the LGBTQ plus community for orientation or identity. So when we refer to these numbers, unfortunately, a lot of them are outdated. That's simply because of cost to prepare these numbers and this data and the time it takes without government protection or intervention. So as you can see, um, the support for same-sex marriage um, or marriage equality, as we call it in, in the community, uh, has grown, I mean, astronomically, uh, up from 27% to 96 to 70% just very recently. As I was saying, there's definitely a, a breakdown of uh, intersectionality within our community as well, as you can see represented here. This is, again, just based on folks who self-disclose their identity and orientation. So the majority of our community does identify um, as non-Hispanic Caucasian. Um, there are a whole laundry list of reasons why I believe the metrics are, are the way they are. A lot of those are because of the communities <clears throat> and the ethnic and racial beliefs and religious practices of certain communities, um, which still prohibit a lot of folks from coming out and living their true identities. Um, we're working on that specifically with our friends at NAREB and NAREB. Uh, I think many of you know the Latino and the black communities are, are very strong in their faith. Um, and those faiths are, are largely Christian based. So there is, um, a great opportunity moving forward to continue to encourage folks to continue to live their authentic selves as they become more comfortable in their in their in their shoes and their skin and their life. So I said something earlier about 10% of the population. And when you're you know looking at that in a pie chart, it's a pretty small fragment. But let me break that down. And, and make it a little bit more weighted. The census reported that there are about 3.1 people per household. This was just in the last round of census data. That's that point one is when you cut kids in half, I think. Um, <clears throat> so if that's accurate, and there are 3.1 people per household and 10% of the population is LGBTQ, that means one in every three households in America has someone who is LGBTQ living in it. That means it's either your neighbor to your left, your neighbor to your right, or someone in your home. So that 10% just became a lot more significant if you think about it in that context. With that comes an enormous potential and responsibility from an economic stance. Since the census does not measure, these numbers are all independently um, sourced. However, the folks at the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce reported that in 2020, our community had $1.7 trillion in economic impact on the GDP of this country. What's even deeper is that we had almost $1 trillion, just the American LGBTQ population had almost $1 trillion in purchase power. That's larger than the domestic GDP of Canada, South Korea, and Australia combined. So the power and the money and, and the need all exist. The community in general right now identifies largely as a transient community. About 35% of our community have stayed in the same location for more than 10 years. That's based on polling that we did last spring at the Alliance. The other portion of the community moves once every five years. They're renters. But the reality of it is, is that our community is just like the general population. And if you can see the, the metrics on the screen, you'll see that the responses to the questions we asked when analyzed to folks who identify as straight, the reasoning is all the same, folks. We're all looking for the same thing. And if the American dream is housing, which I truly believe it is, uh, we're not that far off. Our community is not that far off from the wants, dreams, and desires of our, our straight counterparts living out in the world today. We too partner with Zillow um, from a, a resources stance. They're one of the biggest data collection mechanisms out there, and they have access to more data than a lot of folks aside from um, two of the national organizations here, National Fair Housing and, and the National Association of Realtors. Um, but 12% of all homes that were purchased um, come from our community last year. And that's significant. 
Uh, we talked about the home ownership rate a little bit. I believe that we can get that back on track, but the fact is our community is 54 years behind everyone else. And I say that because the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Rights Amendment of 1968 does not include sexual orientation or gender identity. There are no federal protections in place right now for our community. It's unfortunate because as I said, our wants and dreams are the same. Freddie Mac found that the top four reasons that folks in our community want to own homes are just like everyone else's top four reasons. More so, the independent research that we did last spring, and we're actually next week releasing another report that's very focused on associations, uh, MLSs, and how realtors specifically feel about representation and discrimination. Uh, it, if, if anyone's familiar with the report that NAR just released, it's going to cooperate those results um, and, and probably show a little bit more perceived discrimination, unfortunately. Um, but no, I don't want to ruin that surprise for next week. 40% uh, of our members say that bullying has impacted them and their path to home ownership. The report that we published in April of last year shows a direct correlation between folks who are bullied and harassed in middle school and high school and a lower home ownership rate later in life. And if you think about it, the correlation there is a domino effect. If you're harassed during your school years, you're not focusing on your education. That's gonna impact your placement testing results on your ACT or SAT, which is going to inhibit your ability to gain access to post-secondary, which is going to impact your economic status in this country, which is going to hinder your ability to qualify for a mortgage which is going to create a perpetual cycle of renting. And that all leads back to being bullied in middle school and high school. It's common sense, but we've never said it out loud. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 was a great, great thing that came from the Equal Rights Amendment and it protected a lot of folks. But the reality is today that in 29 states in America, it is legal to evict someone because they're gay to shred a purchase contract the day before closing because they're LGBTQ, to charge them 6% higher on an interest rate on a mortgage because they are LGBTQ, and to deny them access to public shelter. In 29 states in this country, Michigan, unfortunately or fortunately, um, is a fighter. And the battle has been going on since 1973 in this country or in this state. Um, and unfortunately, despite the governor's current executive order, which only applies to state employees, uh, there are no protections in place in this state. I say it's been a battle because that has been changed status probably 10 times since 1973, but between the governor's office and the legislature, uh, it's a back and forth, as I'm sure many of you are very well aware. Um, so we have work to do. Discrimination shows up uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And some of these facts are a little bit more startling than others, some of them a little bit more subtle. 18% of uh, the folks that we polled um, did cite that because of bullying, they did not go to college. It's a significant number. 60, almost 63% of folks um, that we polled reported that discrimination and bullying um, impacted their academic performance. And this was a wide range of folks from their 20s to their 80s who, who were polled. Some of these speak for themselves. I think that second statistic, which now is a non-issue because of the Supreme Court ruling uh, a couple of years ago, but 22% uh, of folks in the workforce um, found that they were being treated differently, noticeably different in their job as opposed to the treatment of their heterosexual partners or peers, I should say. 47% of those folks also believe that being out at work could damage or potentially jeopardize their career status. Our transgender population specific to the LGBTQ community, that's that T in the acronym. And I should say 
We call it the Alliance just because it fumbles off the tongue if you're trying to say LGBTQ real estate Alliance every single time. Um, the Alliance is truly what we are. And that acronym is actually 12 letters long. Um, it depends where you are geographically, right? So our friends to the North in Canada add three more letters in there. We haven't yet, I don't know why. I'm not in charge of that. Um, but it's interesting because our transgender counterparts are disproportionately treated worse than anyone else in our community. If you look at home ownership rates within our community, uh, in that 49%, our ethnic and racially diverse intersectionality, so Black, Latino, Asian, Indigenous folks who identify as LGBTQ, all have home ownership rates under, th under 13% in America. The lowest being the Black gay population, which I believe has a home ownership rate of 7%. So there's work to do. Uh, we went over some of these. My PR guy really likes stats. Feroza Syed is on my national board of directors. She is a, um, an absolutely inspirational, incredible trans activist out of Atlanta, Georgia. She's a realtor for Sotheby's Fine Homes um, in Atlanta. She has done everything from chairing Mayor um, Keisha Longbottom's uh, Diversity Council for the city of Georgia to chairing pride parades at Global Pride in New York City a couple of years ago. In fact, Vogue just did a spread on her um, as one of the most influential trans women in, in America. She has been a realtor for 12 years. She came out three years ago to her peers and her clients because she was afraid that she would lose business if she told folks in the industry and her clients that she was a trans woman living in Georgia. Um, that shouldn't be the case. That's not the America that, that we wanna live in. The Equality Act can solve this problem. It's a piece of legislation that's been revolving the drain in Congress since 1973. It would create federal protection for um, gender identity and sexual orientation on a legislative level, which is big because right now there are temporary protections in place, um, but that's through executive order from the Biden administration. And the Biden administration is quickly running out of time. The next administration could easily roll that back as we've seen from past executive orders. We have made progress. There's no, no question about that. My dear, dear friend, Jim Obergefell, who some of you may be familiar with just based on the name, won his Supreme Court case in 2015, which legalized uh, same-sex marriage in this country. Um, that was a big win. The other big win was just in 2020, when the Supreme Court ruled that protections in the workplace uh, were now the law of the land. So I can no longer get fired working for my company if I just have a picture of my husband on my desk. Prior to 2020, I could. So if you add job security and family stability into the equation, it's natural to think that our home ownership rate is going to rise if we're given the opportunity in all 50 states to own and purchase homes. The president has committed to signing uh, the Equality Act should it get to his desk. Unfortunately, it's not going to this session. Uh, the Senate has not brought it to a floor vote in 40 years. So at the Alliance, it's important that we continue to focus on our advocacy work, on our education, because I truly believe through education is how we touch hearts and minds. Um, we have developed a ton of collateral that's available for download on our website, everything from a fully illustrated first time home buyer's guide um, to interactive virtual sessions that we still do on a quarterly and monthly basis. We have a great report that we published that I've been referencing last April. We've got another one coming out at our policy event this uh, next Thursday. Um, we fight very, very strongly against discrimination specific to our agents and members who, by the way, are probably reporting discrimination on a weekly basis now throughout the country, not just in areas that you would assume, um, but two of our very well-known agents down in Florida started receiving hate letters based on their co-marketing because they're a married couple marketing their business on the same literature. Um, they were attacked. Uh, the National Association of Realtors and Keller Williams both vocally spoke out against that in support of these two. When it happened, we were very grateful for that support. We have a first time, all right, beg your pardon. We have, um, hmm, what is this? What, what do we have? Uh, <laughs> we have a different graphic now is what we have. We created a proprietary Alliance certified ally campaign. This is a two hour 
course, which is a certification um, meant for folks that aren't well acquainted with our community. It's basically uh, a 101 cultural competency on, on all things LGBTQ. It's a two-hour commitment. Like I said, we do offer it once a quarter virtually. It is approved for CE in several states. Unfortunately, Michigan is not one yet, but we're working on it. Um, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to check it out. It is on our website, realestatealliance.org, underneath our, um, our education tab. One thing you can do if you're interested, obviously engage in the community, check out our website, look at membership. There are several different levels of options. Uh, no one's obligated to, but if you're interested, if the data that I shared is moving in any way, shape or form, the next step for you is to get involved and be part of the solution. The easiest way to do that is to join our organization. That's the reality of it. Uh, I will also take a shameless plug any day of the week. Um, if you have the influence at your own organization to remove barriers, please do so. And that can be as simple as putting pronouns in your email signature. So folks not only understand how you identify, but understand that you're creating a safe space for people to ask other people how they identify. Knowledge is power. And just by sitting here today, hopefully you've, you've learned something um, and you understand the uphill battle that our community still faces today. I kind of like this. Last year's word of the year at dictionary.com was allyship. And it really is um, an instrumental word. No minority segment has ever achieved any kind of equality movement in this country without support from allied groups outside of their own. We're in the same situation today that our, our black and Latino brothers and sisters were in back in 68. We need equal rights protections passed and we're not gonna get it done ourselves. We need our straight allies to come to our aid and we need help getting it through Congress. I appreciate your time. I know some of that was heavy. Um, if there are questions, I'll field those at the end, but thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Very powerful. I appreciate your presentation. Ryan, what I learned from your presentation is that 12% of all home buyers are LGBTQ+. That is incredible. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Give Ryan another round of applause, would you? Our next speaker is Tom. I'm sorry, Steve Tom Koviak. He serves as executive director of the Fair Housing Center of Metropolitan Detroit. The Fair Housing Center is one of the oldest fair housing centers in the nation. Prior to serving as executive director, Mr. Tom Koviak has close to 30 years experience specializing in litigation and trial of mortgage lending and fair housing cases. That's incredible. Mr. Tom Koviak obtained federal court jury verdicts of 130,000 and 700,000 under the Fair Housing Act and residential mortgage lending discrimination cases. These are believed to be the first two successful jury verdicts under the Fair Housing Act involving residential lending discrimination and the first court decisions approving of mortgage lending testing. Is that not incredible? I am so excited that we have Steve Tom Koviak here to present to us today. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Do charts and videos grab your attention? Do, uh, do they instruct us? I think they do. So we're gonna start with a couple um, charts and that dealing with the store. I'm used to using my laptop doing this. Just a chart here to show, we're gonna talk about Long Island Divided and steering by real estate agents, but kind of put it in context, it's 
been a theme running through all the years. For example, in the late 1990s, uh, in 19, uh, sorry, late 1980s through 1990, discrimination in sales, there's rental in sales up there, but in the sales market, discrimination against Blacks, 1989, up to 25%. In 2000, it was over 15% Hispanic, again, over 25% in 89. And then in 1990, close to 20%. Those may actually be low, but it's higher even in the, in the uh, rental market. Um, gonna show just a couple of videos, just short little clips. One is gonna be from the late 1990s. Another one's gonna be from 2006. This is in Detroit, our community and then go to Long Island Divided, which is from the 2016 to 2019 time period. So just a couple of years ago. And uh, get to some of the law a little bit later, but there's three different categories. One is if there's agent initiated discussions, which take into consideration race, ethnicity, you know, pros and cons of the community, but have a kind of a race, ethnic component to it. Second one is customer initiated discussion. This is where the customer, right? The person looking for a home initiates a discussion. And the third one would be a customer initiated questions. So how do you respond to those and how do you handle those? So kind of think, put the context of the age or the statements of the agents in context of when it occurred. How did it come up? How did the discussion go in that kind of a way? If you look at it that way, I mean, it's easy to look at it and say, well, that's, you know, that's staring, that's unlawful. That's, of course it is. But how did it get to that point where someone would make a statement like that? How did it come up? Were they trapped? Um, another thing that these three videos will all share is they weren't done. You know, we received complaints. National Fair Housing Alliance receives complaints. Ryan with HUD, they received all kinds of complaints, right? Tens of thousands of complaints. But these were ones where they didn't arise with complaints. They were just kind of undercover investigations to see, hey, what's going on? So no one out to get anybody. They just went out there to see what was going on in the market. And that's when this occurred. So they weren't out to get anybody. They weren't targeting anybody. They were just randomly sending testers out into the market, looking for homes, meeting with agents. That's all they did. And then they recorded the videos. Let me see if I can do this. And now, special assignments. Just one year after the Detroit riots, the Federal Civil Rights Act made it illegal for real estate agents to treat clients differently because of their race. But nearly 30 years later, housing discrimination is still dividing our neighborhoods by color. The Fair Housing Center of Metro Detroit received more than 200 complaints last year. Tonight on Special Assignment, Target 7 investigator Shelley Smith goes undercover to expose real estate racism. Shelley? Well, Guy, you've heard the saying before, location, location, location. It's long been the creed of real estate agents everywhere. But our undercover investigation found here in Metro Detroit, the three most important elements in home sales are sometimes location, location, and race. It's one of the biggest purchases you'll ever make. And the person who holds the key to that new home is often a realtor. You rely on them to find the best deal, the best neighborhood, but you don't expect this. Okay. Okay. To find out just how often agents like this steer clients away from an area, we recruited two women, one white, one black. They both work as testers for the Fair Housing Center in Detroit. Channel 7 staffers posed as their husbands, and we invented cover stories to make their housing searches as similar as possible. Take a look. They're both homemakers. Their household income is about $50,000, and they are both pre-approved for a mortgage. Our white testers went first, visiting this REMAX office in Dearborn. They said they were looking for a three-bedroom bungalow. Well, we've been pre-approved for $90,000, okay. and so we're thinking between sixty dollars and eighty-five. dollars They claim to be new to the area and needed help finding a good location. I don't even know how to say it. You want to be careful <clears throat> what you border. Okay. Okay. If you go Joy Road and Telegraph, you're getting into Redford. Okay. South Redford is wonderful. But if you go east, then you're bordering Detroit. 
and even though it's southwest Detroit, it's still Detroit. We showed our tape to the director of the Fair Housing Center, which monitors discrimination in our area. Certainly there are some things in that that uh, are questionable, uh, and we'd be, be interested in what the agent uh, was thinking about when they, uh, she referred to it as, it's still Detroit, as if there were, uh, might be something wrong with that. But when our white couple visited the Coldwell Banker office in Dearborn, the steering was clear. The tester showed Jim Carmen a list of homes she had selected from the multi-list of available properties. A home in Inkster topped her list. No? Okay. Oh. Okay. Real estate agents know they're not supposed to make those kind of statements. Uh, and, uh, and yet they persist in making them. Certainly that's very strong evidence uh, of uh, discriminatory treatment. When our black testers visited Mr. Carmen, he showed them the listings book and then seemed to have a change of heart about helping them after talking to his broker. And he said he thought it would be best for you to really go to the main office. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Because like I say, I do mostly in the rentals, you know uh -huh. what I'm saying? And it would be better for you because you'd be more qualified. They would than I would to show you these houses. Oh, okay. The discrimination t can take many forms. I mean, it can take an agent saying, well, I just do rentals. <laughs> uh, when, in fact, uh, for whites, he does uh, sales and, uh, and possibly rentals. And you can show anything that we oh, might yeah. see? Oh, yeah. Okay. How common is that? It's a very common thing. Uh, the nationally, the statistics indicate that uh, uh, African Americans uh, seeking housing are discriminated against in uh, sales transactions at least 50% of the time. We caught up with Jim Carmen at his office, hoping to get an explanation of why he tried to steer our white couple away from Inkster. Well, I thought the, the area wasn't right for him, that's all. Why would but you would tell say, him that? Well, it, I don't think it is the way I see him, you know what I mean. Why don't you think the area is right for him? Well, I don't know. Just my opinion. Okay. okay. Do, you, do you know that's against the law to say something well, like that? Well, yeah, I guess that it would be. Did you think that he wouldn't want to live in the same neighborhood as African Americans? No, I wouldn't say that. Well, why did you? I say had a couple of that? a couple of people here this morning that were African Americans. Be glad to show them how if they wanted to see me. That's not exactly how it went. Do you think he could represent us if you know if we if one of these uh, houses we like? I'm it, it really not too much up on it, you know what I'm saying, because I really don't show houses that much anymore. Closing doors on potential home buyers doesn't just affect the racial makeup of a community, okay. it can profoundly affect the individuals involved. Natalie, our tester, was once denied an apartment because of her color. I had a rental agent for an apartment tell me that uh, my people bring down the property values. How did that make you feel when she said that? It made me feel like less than a human. Um, it made me feel um, just substandard. Um, um, it made me feel that whatever strides that my people had made, that my parents had made, that I had made, were just of no consequence. If you think you've been discriminated against by a realtor or a landlord, there are several... Rescue 4 Undercover hit the streets, testing real estate offices at random, walking in and talking to a half a dozen local agents. In short order, we find racism is hard at work here in Metro Detroit. It's a mixture. Well, we are, really. It's mostly all. Come for a ride with a real estate agent we'll call Harry. The way Harry talks about African Americans in the city of Detroit, you might think we're traveling back in time. Oh, pretty much black. But make no mistake, it's 2006, and Harry wants to make sure white customers buy homes in one part of Metro Detroit and blacks buy homes in another. Unless you're going to be down in Riotville downtown or something like that. Rescue 4 hidden cameras roll, exposing the disgraceful secret of racism in real estate. It's called steering when real estate agents direct you into one neighborhood and away from another. And it's illegal to steer if it's based on race, religion, or sexual orientation. But investigators say it happens all the time here in Metro Detroit. Don't believe it? 
take a look at what Rescue 4 caught on hidden camera. They don't want to do nothing. They want a job and get paid, and that's it, and not have to do nothing. What's that? Uh, that's uh, uh, certainly uh, inappropriate, uh, probably illegal. Clifford uh, Shrupp heads up the Fair Housing Center of Metropolitan Detroit. The private nonprofit puts real estate agents to the test sending white clients and black clients with the same income to real estate offices to see if they are treated equal. He says almost half the time, whites are given preferential treatment. That we ought to really <laughs> live with each other. He's saying half race, the time, doesn't he? And that we can do so, and, and, uh, and it makes for a better community when we do do so. Rescue 4 hit the streets to do some testing of our own. In several real estate offices, we found professionals who know discrimination laws on steering and abide by them. We can't tell you what areas are good and what areas are not because we're licensed. We can get sued because it's against the law. And then we found Harry, who blatantly ignores the law. I'm going to want to steer you wrong. Telling our white customer to steer clear of East Point because African Americans are moving in. The house is never going to fine and dandy. You're just starting to get an influx of minorities. When Rescue 4 sends in an African-American posing as a potential buyer, Harry's polite and courteous. Then he suggests the black buyer look at homes in East Point. That's in East Point also. The same city he told our white producer to steer clear of because minorities were moving in. Rescue 4 travels much of Metro Detroit with Harry. He tells us we don't want to live in Southfield. It's not white. <laughs> oh, not white? Not white at all, no. Huh? Pretty much black. Not in Hamtramck. I would say probably a good 40% of the population right now is black. Or in Warren. It's getting mixed. Oh, getting mixed? And definitely not in Detroit. The house down there in Detroit, that's just like a war zone, I'll tell you. You wouldn't want to live there. Harry tells us African Americans can make for bad neighbors. These people don't, Mike, I hate to criticize them. What do you do? They're human beings, but. They don't want to do nothing. They want a job and get paid, and that's it, and not have to do nothing. What's that? Oh, okay. I'm not picking on them. I, I can't help it. It's facts are facts. He tells our white producer that St. Clair Shores is the perfect place for him. Our undercover black producer is never told about the house in St. Clair Shores, even though she was in the same price range, asking for similar homes. She would have missed out on the opportunity to buy in St. Clair Shores. The Fair Housing Commission says... That's discrimination. They, they don't know what somebody of a different race is being told. Rescue 4 has seen enough of this realtor steering. It's time to talk to Harry. Do you know what steering is? The yeah. term steering? Oh, yeah. It's when you tell yeah. people go to a certain, certain, go in a certain place. And you know that's no. illegal in sure the real is. estate game. Sure it is. I know that. But you've been doing that with this gentleman. No, I have not. I've shown him different houses wherever he wanted to go. And you've told him that 40% uh, black people live in Hamtramck or uh, that Southfield's mostly black, which are those are things you can't tell people. No, no, I haven't told him that. Harry denies it, even when I tell him it's all on Rescue 4 undercover hidden camera. But I'm going to be able to show you on camera that you are, in fact, saying that. You did, in fact, that. I'm that. showing that I'm saying that to him? Correct. I like to know where. They don't want to do nothing. Hey. Not what at all. I would say probably a good 40% of the population right now is black. Unless you're going to be down in Riotville downtown or something like that. Pretty much black. I'll be very honest with you. All right, one last one. Just bear with me. Um, but this is a progressive liberal community, right? Long Island. Affluent. We shouldn't have problems there. And then not during 2016 and 2019. I mean, steering should be a, you know, practice of the past, archaic. We'd think, right? Yeah. So, one, two, three. My name is Jesus Rivera. Today's the 21st of, 21st of April. It's about 10 after 2, and I'm uh, in my car. So, it's Richard Helling testing as Pat Browning on May 3rd. Hello. Hi, Hi my name is Kelvin too. How you doing? Uh, yes, yeah, Kelvin. How are you? Yeah, me and my wife is looking to purchase a home okay. which is the Burwood area. They were ordinary Long Islanders. Right. Maybe go get some more then, okay? And we sent them to meet with real estate agents to ask about buying their first home. Nice to meet you, thank you. All good. 
They were trained, confident, and followed scripts. Tag in Stephen Macropolis as Nicholas Parisi. They had no idea what houses agents would suggest or even which communities. You were not going to like those schools. But you don't want to go there. It's a mixed neighborhood. Mixed neighborhood. If agents are courteous and professional, how can you know that they're treating you equally compared with someone of a different race or ethnicity? I have to say it without saying it, you know. Behind smiles and handshakes, how do you know if they're giving you fewer options or suggesting different areas? I'm not going to send you anything you want to unless you don't want to store your car to buy your crap. Or that rules don't apply to you and another home buyer in the same way. Yeah, okay. I definitely need that. Long Island is one of America's most segregated suburbs. Newsday set out to discover what role real estate agents might play in keeping it that way, potentially affecting the quality of lives. Technically, as a real estate agent, we shouldn't tell you the buyers. In house hunting, it's nearly impossible to see evidence of hidden discrimination. You would never know unless you go undercover. In one test, Johnny May Alston was the black tester and Cindy Parry was the white tester. And they met with Anne-Marie Queeley Bichon at Signature Premier Properties office in Cold Spring Harbor. They asked for the same thing. As often happens, the agent discussed getting pre-qualified or pre-approved for a mortgage by a bank, showing how much a buyer can spend on a house. Pre-qualified, I asked my, um, Husband's working with somebody in a bank. We've done some preliminary talks, you know, about getting pre-approved. Neither had been pre-approved or pre-qualified. Here's what the agent told the black tester. Oh, so I really need that. I won't take out any money unless I do have a pre-qualification letter. So I need to so know that, means that I can't pre-qualify for a mortgage. Oh, so that means I can't go out to see anything. I won't, I won't do it. You can try another person, but I don't have the time. And without pre-approval, here's what the agent told the white tester. Um, what is your availability? When can we start looking at houses? Um, I would say not this coming week. Cindy received 79 listings from this agent. Johnny May couldn't get any listings. Mm -hmm. And Cindy, the white tester, received two home tours. Yes. They had the same finances, the same budget, and they made the same request in the same area. But one was white, the other was black. The agent treated them differently. Queely Bichon did not respond to a letter, calls, and emails. Her agency, Signature Premier Properties, co-owner and two branch managers viewed the recordings and declined to comment. A three-year undercover Newsday investigation revealed evidence of widespread hidden discrimination by real estate agents brokering home sales across Long Island. For Hispanic home seekers, evidence of unfair treatment emerged 39% of the time. For Asians, the rate was 19%. Black house hunters in the investigation risked unequal, lesser access to homes and communities just about half the time when compared to white buyers. Kelvin Toon is a black man in his early 50s, and he went in to meet with an agent involving a test in the Brentwood community, a community that is 80% Hispanic and black. The agent communicated to Kelvin, our black tester, that she enjoyed meeting with clients from the Brentwood area. Every time I get a new listing in Brentwood or a new client, uh -huh. I get so excited because they're the nice people. When we sent Kelvin's counterpart in to meet with the same agent. The white tester was actually uh, warned about Brentwood not being a nice place. The nursery home we need to be near is is near is in Brentwood. Okay. And so we and found a couple that are in Brentwood. Pretty, pretty close to each other. Okay. 
And it just seemed like those would be handy also for going to Do you to want visit. to give me them and I'll look into them for you? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That warning came later to the white testers saying there was concern about gang activity going on in Brentwood. <laughs> This agent wanted the white tester to know, but that information wasn't provided uh, to Kelvin, the black tester. The listings centered black tester Kelvin in Brentwood with 27 house listings. While the white tester got zero listings in Brentwood and was directed towards much whiter neighborhoods. Vickery said she had warned only the white tester about gang activity because she had not been aware of it when she met with the black tester despite widespread media coverage. She also said her business partner, Gene Gillen, sent the listings to the black tester. Gillen said the listings were unquestionably prepared based on Vickery's criteria and that Vickery may have sent the listings using Gillen's email. She said she didn't know the race of the black tester until she met him later on a house tour. Keller Williams, which was their employer at the time, released this statement. Keller Williams does not tolerate discrimination of any kind. All complaints of less than exemplary conduct are addressed and resolved. Newsday conducted 86 tests that matched white and black, white and Hispanic, and white and Asian buyers. We focused on agents associated with the 12 brands that represented more than half of the island's home sellers in 2017. The primary question was whether the agents provided equal service. Was one tester provided more listings than the other? Also, where were those listings placed? Did the agent recommend similar neighborhoods to both testers? Here in test 56, the agent Frederick Wallenmeyer provided the testers with comparable listings. In my eyes, you're a buyer, you're a buyer. I wanted to give my, the potential buyer, a more diverse look and background of the Hamptons and what they like. The same two testers from number meant 56 that. met with a different agent, Kevin Getty, in test 59. And despite asking for the same parameters, they received disparate listings. Community came in, okay. and they really um, took over Springs and Northwest Woods area. In an email, Getty described his statement about the Hispanic community as out of context, adding, I apologize for the remark, and I look forward to continually improving in order to serve all of my clients with respect. He added the statement does not represent who I am as a person, and does not reflect my professional commitment to treat everyone, clients, family, and friends equally and with respect. As permitted by law, Newsday recorded all meetings between testers and agents and then transcribed the recordings. Here, an agent gives conflicting advice about Freeport. I like Freeport. Now you have a bad school district, and, and that's not good for resale value. Matching those tests, mapping the listings, and relying on the judgment of fair housing experts, you start to get a picture of whether an agent, or more importantly, agents at large across Long Island, engaged in different treatment of testers. All the school bus, see the moms that are hanging out on the corners. But you don't want to go there, it's a mixed neighborhood. Sure. It's mini okay. United Nations. Okay. Because you might be more comfortable in a certain demographic area that isn't heavily one way or another in terms of the heat. Bayshore has two school districts, Brentwood and Bayshore. You don't want to have Brentwood school districts. You want to have Bayshore school districts. I can't say anything, but I encourage you, I want you to go there at 10 o'clock at night if you want to buy diapers. Go to that 7-Eleven. They didn't buy there. <laughs> no, that's great. I have to say it without saying it. You know, you have the knowledge of the areas. Yes. I don't want to use the word steal. I'll stop right there. Isn't that revealing, though? I don't want to use the word steer. <laughs> she just did. 
Um, these videos, um, thanks, Jimar, for um, being able to embed. I embedded them into the PowerPoint. So when you download it, it's a big file, but you'll have these videos. This whole one here is about 40 minutes. I'm stopping at about the 10 and a half minute point. Um, but you can take a look at them in the entirety. And you know, many people here are leaders in their community, in their office. Um, play it, discuss it. At the end of my PowerPoint is a series of questions and how you would respond to those questions. They're, they're there for discussion purposes. How would you respond if the customer asked this or that? So that the questions don't come up and you're caught by surprise, not prepared, what's the best way to respond to it? You need to have a plan and you need to make sure. It's not enough just say of a commitment to fair housing. Everybody says it, even when they're caught, they say it. Um, but really actually doing it in practice, that's, that's really the main thing. Um, Brian mentioned he's right, close to 50%, 49. What's the difference between 49 and 50? Not much, it's the same thing. Um, but it's shocking that it was so consistent from the early, late 1990s, uh, late 1980s, all the way to 2006 and to now, it hasn't changed. Um, Hispanics also face severe poor treatment and we know about discrimination against Asian Americans as well. It's very troubling. Um, go through, you know, they call it steering. I mean, they know it's steering, even if they don't use the word, but everybody knows steering. Um, so these are studies, but um, it, Greg Squires, Professor Squires says, this is something that didn't happen in the deep South. It happened in one of the most educated, most liberal regions of the country. These are significant numbers and they certainly are. Um, dominant real estate firms are help solidifying racial separation by directing white customers, home seekers to white areas, high, white majority areas, and doing the opposite with black or minority borrowers, steering them to more integrated or more heavily minority communities. And that perpetuates segregation. Don't need to say anything about segregation in our community here. Just real quick on the law, kind of interesting, you see the way HUD puts it into the Fair Housing Act and its regulations. Two types of steering. One, of course, is apartment manager complex steering minorities to other properties or families with children, that type of a thing. But here we're gonna focus on real estate agents refusing to show homes in white neighborhoods to minority prospects. And interesting, steering isn't mentioned in any of the laws per se. It's not mentioned in the Fair Housing Act. Section 1981, 1982, primarily Section 1982. It's not mentioned in Michigan, Elliott Larson or Michigan Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act. It's not mentioned in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and that's construed consistent with the Fair Housing Act. Two Supreme Court decisions dealt with the issue of standing, but they acknowledge steering. Gladstone Realtors and Havens Realty. That goes back to 1979, 1982. After those decisions, even at the time of it, lower federal courts were finding that steering violated four different four sections of the Fair Housing Act for A, refusal or denial, or make unavailable or deny housing. B is terms and conditions. C is discriminatory statements. And D is misrepresentation regarding availability of property. Um, steering also violates 42 USC 1982. HUD and their fair housing regulations to implement the Fair Housing Act defined unlawful steering to violate 804A. That's probably the best approach. Keeps it simple anyway. So it is a refusal or denial or otherwise make unavailable housing. And that's what steering does. And interesting, it really restricts the choice. These are a um, couple slides that show the definitions of steering by Gladstone and Havens Realty. But Judge Keith, late Judge Keith, um, Damon Keith, he moved up to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, but he wrote this while he was serving as a district judge. Unlawful steering or channeling of a prospective buyer is the use of a word or phrase or action, right? Doesn't even have to be a word. You could just do a gesture to communicate. It can be steering by a real estate broker or salesperson, which is intended to influence the choice of a prospective property buyer on a racial basis where choice influencing factors such as race are not eliminated, freedom of choice and the purchase of real estate becomes a fantasy. It's the freedom of choice is the value that's underlying this. It is a freedom of choice for the purchaser which the Fair Housing Act protects. Hence, race need not be the sole reason for the defendant's conduct if it is an element of that conduct. And HUD uses it. There's a couple of decisions. I could have got all kinds of decisions because there's 
so many steering decisions. I just picked the Sixth Circuit because that's the Federal Court of Appeals over Michigan. All federal appeals cases are governed um, by the decisions by the Sixth Circuit. And there's a just real fast um, McDonald versus verbal. And it said that um, the did not mention MacArthur Park property to a black home seeker. Didn't do it. He asked a number of times whether there any property in MacArthur Park. Defendant insisted there was not. And after persistent, then he mentioned that there was one property, but it's on Forest Drive. Then he said, well, I was looking to buy it for myself and so forth, right? He just withheld it. That's a violation, right? And then race doesn't even need, uh, if it's steering in that, it's not fixed that belatedly the agent then lets them know, oh, this property is available. I wasn't approved for financing. You can then move, you know, buy the property, whatever. It doesn't cure it. Discrimination occurs when there's the act of steering. Doesn't, it's not a fixable thing later on. It's not excused because they do that. So yeah, if you give the proper listing or fair listing after you're forced to do so, right, still a problem. Um, I'm not gonna you know, read these, but um, uh, when in this Heights Community Congress case argued that, well, the agent gave truthful information. So because truthful information, even though it may have a racial content regarding failure to show homes in a particular location, won't violate the Fair Housing Act, court said no. Even if it's truthful, if it's done with an intent to steer people to or away from communities is a violation. The idea is a reasonable home seeker, how would they interpret the statements, the conduct, the gestures that are made by the agent? If the result of it is it would put persons steering them toward one community or away from another, that's a violation. Another interesting one, they argued that, well, the agents were independent contractors. Sometimes people, those are like a state law defense. There's no federal independent contractor. Independent contractor is under state law. Employment contracts are state law. Mortgages, real estate contracts are state law. Doesn't apply to the Fair Housing Act. So the agent, the broker can be liable for the actions of quote unquote independent contractors. So that didn't work, right? If you have some measure of control, right? Um, so this argument has been consistently rejected in Federal Housing Act cases, right? They managerial people knew of the fair housing violations and failed to take corrective action, despite its policy to instruct agents to comply with the fair housing law and urge that they act accordingly. So that doesn't work either. Discrimination law strips past those things. If someone denies a reasonable accommodation, it doesn't matter what the condominium documents say. <laughs> it's just, it, it, it's not a defense. Um, one last one, Doris case, Sanders versus Doris. It's statistical evidence, it's appalling. In 10 years, she never sold a house in Greenbrier to a black person, only once shown a house in Greenbrier to a potential black purchaser. They sold homes to blacks in Springfield, a racially mixed community. None of the agents could ever recall showing or selling a house in Greenbrier to blacks. Isn't that something? And the home prices were roughly the same, right? So that's just showing like they did in Newsday where they just plotted them on the graph where the homes listings were being shown. Um, real quick, HUD in its regulation on steering, notice what it says here, it's unlawful to do what? Based on race, it does, it can be steering is not limited to race, right? It can be national origin, it could be sexual orientation, could be any protected class category. But what it does is it restricts or attempts to restrict the choices of a person by word or conduct in connection with seeking to buy a dwelling and what the effect of it is to perpetuate or tend to perpetuate segregated housing patterns and it discourages or obstructs choices. So it's the same thing. HUD took what's in the case law and put it into the regulation. It's the freedom of choice of the purchaser as to where they want to live. Steering obstructs that and it has a bad effect on the community. And then HUD also gave four illustrations of what would constitute unlawful discrimination. I like subsection two, and it, it, it says by what? Exaggerating drawbacks of a particular area or home or community or failing to inform a person of desirable aspects. And that's what steering is. Another one is three, 
here is um, communicating that he or she would not be comfortable or compatible with existing residents of a community neighborhood or development is steering as well. And the fourth one is assigning a person to a particular section of a community. That's also unlawful steering. And that's what's shown again by those dots showing where people were showing listings, right? It should not be that way. Um, so here's to conclude with this, the customer, what if the customer raises the question about rate or ethnicity? Will that still be unlawful steering? Will be unlawful steering if the real estate agent provides truthful answers to questions asked by the buyer or seller? Professor Schwem, he was in the last picture with the experts. Um, he breaks it down into three categories, sales, person, initiated discussions. Those are intended to influence a buyer's choice that will be viewed as unlawful steering. If it's a customer initiated discussion, same thing, if the salesperson responds by actively influencing the customer's choice on racial or ethnic grounds, that will be viewed as unlawful steering. Then the third one, if the customer initiates specific customer initiated question, um, courts are kind of split, it's unsettled with it. I wouldn't give it, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't put, you know, want you to be in a risky situation with that as well even though it's not definitively resolved by cases or whatever. The idea is to avoid <laughs> being charged with discrimination, not win it. Ideally, you know, you don't want that, um, but it hasn't been resolved. But you have to make sure that whatever, just have it in mind that there's a camera rolling, even if it's not, just assume it. There was a recent Sixth Circuit decision, like I think last month, which approved one party consent in Michigan. So we can obviously record, Tests, tests are getting recorded. Um, like New York, New York, they were allowed to do one party consent. I'm not gonna go through it now, but there's a series of questions that you can take back to your office, watch the videos, have a discussion about how would you handle these kinds of things? Will property values go down if minorities move in? Those kinds of questions, right? Um, what color, religion, nationality are the prospects? Can I get sued? by some of the minorities, are these home buyers really qualified? You see the idea, these are common questions that people ask. Um, if I take my home off the market, how long do I have to wait before I can market it again? I want your office to market it, no MLS and no signs, they attract undesirables. You can do that, can't you? And how do you handle that, right? We need to be ready and have a plan when these questions come up. You wait till it comes up and you're not ready, right? Can you do this consistent with good sound business practices and making sales? Yes. Safest approach is to do what? I tell people, make the mortgage, you know, allow emotional support animal or service animal or, you know, not if they're clearly not qualified and there's no sound basis for it, absolutely say no. But other than that, if you can't have good solid grounds for saying no, Everybody gets same access to the same listings. That's just how we do it. And that's good for business and it's good for fair housing and fair housing opens up doors of opportunity for people. So I, I'm not gonna go through these. And then a couple of real quick things. Um, did a presentation, Fair Lending in Detroit 2022. And it has some data from the 20, 2021 Humda data came out. Um, and it shows as I think Brian mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned it, that there's just lack of black participation in the home purchase mortgage and mortgage market. It's sad. Over half don't even get to the point of, I think a lot of people don't even consider home ownership, home purchase, home financing as an option. Um, another disturbing thing, even before you get to the disparities, you've got a non-participation. Uh, there's some with Hispanic as well, but you can see it within Detroit itself and within Detroit, Wayne County, Michigan, in the U.S., I have the data across. Um, and then uh, in 20% of the loan denials in Detroit, inadequate collateral or the appraised value of the home was a reason for a loan denial. 20%. That's extremely high. Um, so take a look at that. It's on fairhousingdetroit.org. Look under news, whatever. It's a blog there. It'll have the um, data, the statistics on mortgage lending in Detroit. And you can take a look at that as well. Um, one quick thing too, we have a, um, 
oh, we have an appraisal case where the discrepancy was 290%, $255,000 independent appraisal said 255, the bank said 87, 290%. And then um, we have a fair housing bucket on April 30th, Professor Van Dusen, off, author of Burwood Wall, or Eight Mile Wall, as we often call it, will be speaking briefly at the bike a So you're welcome to come to that as well. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And again, if you need further information, please feel free to reach out to our office and put a plug in for the National Fair Housing Alliance as well. They do great work. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I am so glad that you were able to join us and share a breadth and depth of information about steering still being a structural, uh, systematic racist issue in 2022. This is some heavy content, folks, right? But we are the champions here in this room. We all make a difference, and a difference is being made daily. Uh, it's been such an, inform an informative morning. Our committee members have been walking around to collect those index cards. If you have an index card that needs to be collected, please just put your hand up and someone will collect that index card from you. We are looking forward to the questions. We will do our best to manage as many questions as we possibly can to get those questions answered. Uh, we have bonus information from James Huang. It is a pre-recorded video. Uh, James is speaking on behalf of the Asian Real Estate Association of America. James Huang is the president of EXP Commercial Division and that is a division within the EXP World Holdings. So we will see that video. In October, 2019, James was installed as the national president of ARIA, which is the Asian Real Estate Association of America. Let's turn our attention to the screen and listen to this presentation by James Hello, everyone. I just want to thank GMAR Diversity Inclusion Committee Fair for allowing me to have this opportunity to share a little about the AAPI story. Hello, everyone. My name is James Wong, and I was ARIA's national president for 2020. Uh, who is ARIA? ARIA is the Asian Real Estate Association of America with over 41 chapters and 17,000 plus members. It is dedicated to promoting sustainable home ownership opportunities in the Asian America community by creating a very powerful national voice for housing and the real estate professional that they serve within this dynamic market. Founded in 2003, the Asian American Real Estate Association of America, ARIA, is a non national nonprofit trade organization dedicated to improving the lives of Asian American and Pacific Islander through communities through home ownership. Some of ARIA's achievements was the No Other campaign, where ARIA successfully persuaded the U.S. Census to track and include Asian housing data as a standalone category in its quarterly reports on home ownership by race and ethnicity. Also, Translation Clearinghouse, ARIA collaborated with the GSE to create translated resources in Chinese for LEP borrowers, Korean, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and set to launch that later on this year. We also preferred language field where ARIA worked with FHFA to include a preferred language field on a 2020 redesigned URL in order to better capture the needs of the LEP borrower. In 2019, the FA, FHFA removed the questions, uh, so ARIA continued to advocate for the reversal of this decision. Eliminating the 1% rule, ARIA hoped to change underwriting standards to be more fair account for the student loans that were deferment when calculating a borrower's debt to income ratio. As everyone know, during 2020 was a very difficult year. I remember starting my presidency 
in October 2019, where I still was able to travel and still see many of the ARIA chapters all around. And I know March 13th, when it all ended, when I could not travel anymore, but we still kept up our mission of ARIA by going virtual, where we still kept our mission of our three-point plan and our State of Asia America report. Over the core mission is our three-year three-point plan, where we advocated for language access, credit scoring, and fair housing, and other important issues that affected the AAPI community. This year in May 10th through 12th, which is also Asian Heritage Month, we have our ARIA Diversity and Fair Housing Summit, which is a multi-day event in which ARIA members from across the country gather in DC to present issues that are affecting the AAPI home ownership to their representatives, receive political training, and advocate for important political policy points. This includes ARIA's three-point plan as outlined in the bill with our goals to increase sustainable AAPI home ownership. The Diversity and Housing Summit will take place this May, which is Asian American Heritage Month. So we hope that you all will be able to attend with us in DC. From there, what we've always done is from 2015 is working on the State of Asia America report. This is the paramount information in the real estate community to talk about AAPI and its home ownership and real estate trends. One thing that I've learned being part of ARIA and listening to many of the stories is how, how far AAPIs go back. I've actually learned that within the 1760s, is there, there was a first Filipino settlement in Louisiana. And when we talk about the Asian community, many people think of us as one large monolith but we are a diverse group of many peoples, cultures, and languages. We are actually 51 different ethnicities and 26 different languages. You know, most of the AAPIs do live on the coastal or in Hawaii, on the West Coast or East Coast where we're highly concentrated. But as before the 2020, 2020 happened, most of uh, the AAPI were moving for more cost-effective locations with good climate, great schools, and uh, more affordability. So we did see prior to 2020, many AAPIs migrating to secondary markets and other cities. But during this time, we've known during COVID, we've had Asian hate where over the time that we've seen, we've seen a uptick of violence towards the AAPI community. We've seen that during COVID-19, the pandemic, we had a disproportional effect on our communities of color, including the diverse Asian American population, further exposing existing racial and economic dis dis disparities. Many within the NHPI community work more in the frontline industries such as food service, hospitality, and healthcare. We also had a many amount of the NHPI community where the healthcare insurance coverage rates were lower than the coverage than the average. Many also have underlying health conditions at a higher rate of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and tobacco use. During this time, we, ha we had a stop Asian hate where many reported as over 3,800 reports of racism and discrimination that were targeted towards Asian Americans between March 19, 2020 to February 28, 2021. Asian Americans lost more jobs during this pandemic, hurting workers, families, restaurants, and small businesses. In the fourth quarter of 2020, 46% of unemployed Asian workers have been out of work for more than six months as compared to 21% of the fourth quarter in 2019 from the Pew Research Report. Our business community has been hit hard, not only by the mandatory lockdowns, but also through xenophobia. In, two, in, in January 2021, 44% of the unemployed Asian American women suffered long-term unemployment, mainly due to the occupation within the service sectors impacted by the mandatory shutdown. How will the Asian American community recover from this pandemic? We know with all of your help and being part of ARIA 
and supporting the AAPI cause of home ownership and fair housing. We know we can all grow through this and get stronger through the pandemic. You know, I am very excited that I had my time to serve as ARIA's national president, but let me tell you a little bit about our members. Our members is represented by 51 different ethnicities and 26 different languages. Our membership is both multilingual and multicultural. 74% of our members hold a four-year degree and earn an average income of 160,000, 60% higher than the average income of the National Association of Realtor members. The average AAPI, the average ARIA member is a seasoned industry veteran with over 14 years experience. Why we need you, our members and our partners to enable us to carry out our vision and mission to represent the AAPI community in advocating for greater home ownership access for all. Through your support, we are able to provide national events where we're able to educate and develop our members and the larger real estate industry at whole. We believe that these events such as ours are vital in developing successful AAPI leaders in the brokerage, lending and banking and real estate industries. With greater leadership and success in these industries, AAPI representations grow. With your participation, we have the resources to advocate on behalf of the AAPI to key decision makers in the US Senate, House of Representatives, government-sponsored enterprises, as well as important policy makers in the Federal Housing Finance Agency, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and other governments and agencies. So please join us and be a member of ARIA to learn about our events and education, and please download the State of Asia America report so you can better understand the AAPI community, which we all serve. Thank you so much for this time and have a great conference. Thank you for joining us virtually, James. We appreciate that great information about ARIA and how you are advocating for home ownership for all. It's time for questions and our esteemed in-person panelists will be answering those questions. Have I collected all of the index cards? We have about 15 minutes left for questions. We'll go into prizes after that and then lunch. Okay, so panelists, remember to speak directly into the mic so that our virtual participants can hear you. And anyone who wants to volunteer for the to answer the question, I would appreciate that. Otherwise, I have to pick you. Okay. All right. So our first question is: Are we doing any tracking on home mortgage interest rates offered to minorities who have the same FICO scores as their white counterparts? I don't think the information is readily available um, right now. The um, credit bureaus don't, sorry, not the credit bureaus, but like the regulatory agencies who have the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data don't have the FICO data with it. Um, I know there's always been talk about trying to, to bring those things together, but I don't think it's easy to produce. Thank you for that answer. And Brian, you might as well keep the mic. This next question uh, is. So you're going to, you're signing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brian, tell us oh. about your experience with HUD. And do you think that HUD is still uh, relevant and effective as a fair housing venue? Oh, that's a good question. So um, <laughs> I worked the better part of my life at HUD. And um, Let's put it this way. I think HUD has been um, more effective at uh, different times. And I think the biggest challenge for HUD is that it relies too much on um, filing of individual complaints that typical um, consumer doesn't know they're facing discrimination when they face it, as you see from those videos. Uh, and so HUD, in order to be effective, really needs to do more testing. It needs to support testing by private for housing groups, 
I think it ought to have its own unit that does testing. Um, there can't be enough. And at the National Association of Realtors, we've been strong advocates of testing. We don't want people engaged in the profession. We don't want people calling themselves realtors who are um, discriminating. So that's really going to make HUD more effective. And then beyond that, I would say they need to do the big cases, the systemic cases, uh, and not just rely on you know individual ones. So they can develop evidence. They can look at lenders. They can get data um, like uh, FICO scores and other things from lenders. So it really needs to be funded well to do that, and it needs to have the will to do that. And, and that's always been challenging at HUD. Um, people feel sort of, I guess, deluged by the individual complaints and sort of lose sight of the bigger vision. Thank you. Our next question. You, you know what, I'm gonna take that a step further because I don't know if Brian could say this. Um, I have no problem saying it. Uh, the other part of that question, is relative to elections having consequences. And when an administration comes in and guts a department, it takes the resources away to adequately administer policy. So for a period of time in the last decade, HUD was severely understaffed and programs were scaled back massively, which prohibited a lot of enforcement. Um, you can all come to your own conclusions on that, but when our agencies are staffed adequately and able to actually follow up, on complaints, they have more power to actually act as well. Yeah, just to follow up with Brian's comment, um, where you don't get um, credit score in, in HUMDA publicly available, it has to take an individual case where those records can then get required to be produced. Um, Lending Panner for Detroit did a subprime indicator analysis for Detroit. Um, black, is, black applicants who had subprime indicators 23% of the time compared to just 9% nationally. Asian Americans, 33, roughly 4% compared to 2% nationally. So the widest disparity was with black applicants. White subprime indicator, 7% nationwide, 4%. So there's a real problem with Detroit. Um, another thing within lenders in Detroit, the approval rates range from as high as 74% down to 18%, 23%. So it depends on a lender by lender basis, but there just is not enough monitoring and enforcement on a lender by lender basis. There's some that just are not approving people. The percentages are just so low. So it really makes a difference. And you know it, you, you know, you do your loans and you can't get them to go through or you purchases because the loans don't get approved. So that's a real problem. Um, but there needs to be more work. I mean, all of us share responsibility for making sure that happens. Thank you. Our next question is, with federal legislation unlikely, what can local governments and local municipalities do to protect the LGBTQ plus community? Everything. Um, that's where we rely right now. We rely on, on the states that were on that map on, on screen that were shaded in blue. Um, the ironic part is that the folks that live in those states assume that because their rights are protected in that state that it's federal policy. Um, within the state of Michigan, you have counties and cities who have enacted local policy and doctrine protecting orientation and identity. The city of Detroit's one of those jurisdictions, um, several counties throughout the state. Uh, and if there is a lack of federal guidance, then it defers over to the state. If there's a lack of state, then it falls to the county and municipality. So, it, you know, it, it all comes down on to local, elections, local decisions. Um, I know Michigan has tried through referendums several times and come up frustratingly short on signatures to get ballot measures in place to, to make this a statewide protection thing. But until it's a federal policy, it, it does come down to the state and, and those state protections are enforced. So the, the answer is everything. Thank you. Um, at the at the federal level, it's, it's, it's a matter of court decision. Certainly um, sexual orientation, gender identity, transgender status is not in the Fair Housing Act. It's not in any of the federal laws. It's not in any of the laws in Michigan. However, by court decision, the Supreme Court in Bostock um, said that sexual orientation and gender identity falls within this protection of sex for purposes of Title VII. Bostock has been um, followed 
and even before Bostock, there's a Seventh Circuit case, Andrews Living Center, Community Center, Glen St. Andrew Living Community Center, where it said that the term sex covers um, sexual orientation um, for protection for uh, open lesbians who live there. Michigan right now, the Michigan Supreme Court heard oral arguments last month in a case, Rouch World LLC versus MDCR, to see whether the term word sex in Elliot Larson covers sexual orientation. I can't predict, you never can predict what a court will do, but I think it's in the 90% likelihood that they're going to follow suit and say that Elliot Larson, the term sex covers sexual orientation. Well, that's only going to address sexual orientation. But practically speaking, my training for years has always been when you see sex, interpret it to cover sexual orientation, gender identity, transgender status, period, whether it's employment, housing, anywhere. Anyone who thinks that they can discriminate based on those categories and not be held liable in a court is making a very serious mistake. Um, Ryan is talking about legislative acknowledgement of it at the state or local level. That's another question. It's not going to matter because the courts have already ruling on it that it is protected. So it doesn't matter what the legislature or uh, city council does in terms of including sexual orientation, gender identity, or transgender status is still going to be protected because based on court decisions. Thank you. I, I would, yes, Steve, and, and Steve and I can go back and forth all day on this, but the reality is, is that our organization is gearing up for two very, very, very likely um, Supreme Court decisions this spring, which would be overturning Roe Wade uh, and then overturning the Obergefell verdict. And if that happens, then we're losing precedence, unfortunately. Um, so it's all subjective to in on on the judicial side to precedent at the Supreme Court level. So I, I was just going to say some something similar to Steve that at least with respect to the Fair Housing Act, um, HUD is enforcing uh, sex discrimination to cover um, LGBTQ plus cases and. I would hold them accountable. I mean, they they have charged some cases now, um, and you know it's unclear whether or not uh, those will go into the federal court system. Um, many of the cases that get filed with HUD obtain some resolution, um, you know, uh, informally. So people have a recourse um, now. If it goes to Supreme Court, I think it's very likely that a Fair Housing Act case will be decided just as Bostock is, because there's very little daylight between uh, employment law and, and Fair Housing Act law on this particular issue. So I do think there is a recourse. It would be um, sealed up, you know, and solid if we pass the Equality Act, but I don't want to discourage people from filing complaints with HUD. There's a great opportunity now to actually um, get redress. I want to pivot a bit. This next question is specifically about realtors, and it references the 57% of realtors who did not acknowledge a problem exists with discrimination. How do we get them to the table? Uh, because it's unlikely that they're in the room here if they don't even acknowledge it exists. So how do we get them involved and in, in, bring them in? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, one, we keep talking about it. We keep having these sessions. Uh, it's interesting. We, we've asked this question a number of times and we've seen it kind of go back and forth. Uh, right after the Long Island Divided video that you saw, uh, it was around 54. And then around um, after the killing of George Floyd, um, more people acknowledge. I think it was like down to like 49. And strangely, it's like up to 57 people, you know? Um, so I think it's engagement. Um, I think to some degree, it may be publicizing cases and issues that arise. Uh, you know, some of this, I think, is just an unwillingness to acknowledge a problem. And so the more that the problem, I think, is put in front of people and people understand um, you know, the need to address it, I think we could see a change in those numbers. Thank you. I actually have um, a comment on that. So I worked, before I joined NAFA, I worked for a state realtor association for about six and a half years. Um, and now that I'm uh, working for a civil rights organization, 
um, I can say some things that were kind of unpopular um, at that time. And I encourage um, realtor associations, and this was, you know, goes more to, to state level efforts, but to require fair housing education. Only about what half the states have continuing education requirements. So, so take the topic specifically fair housing, um, things related to bias, these disparity statistics, weave them into all of the, the education. Because to your point, the people that really most need to hear it don't show up, they're not in the room. So you kind of have to um, you know, cram the information in where you can. It's, it's not gonna change hearts and minds. Um, well, hopefully it will change minds. It might not change hearts. Um, but highlighting the, the educational um, um, resources that are available and the history of fair housing and housing in this country is really critical. And just to underscore the point further, not a single person should leave this room or a single person who wa was watching from home answering that question saying, you know, I don't believe it exists. Once you see those videos, there's no way you can say that, right? So we have to keep showing these videos and putting this information in front of people. But often it's going to be, I think, circumstances that's going to force it. And oh, and all right, well, Ryan's giving a plug for some, some training we're, we're doing. And then, you know, we, we have an interesting, innovative training that we have launched called Fairhaven, where uh, you, it's a simulation where you um, on a computer are going through real estate transactions and you have to close transactions and you're presented with different scenarios um, where you might face, where you may witness discrimination or you may find yourself drawn into a situation where you might uh, engage in discrimination. And uh, it covers all the prohibited bases under the Fair Housing Act and sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and we find that's a really engaging way for people to learn uh, and to better recognize how discrimination comes up. You know, I took the Fairhaven um, simulation and I was shocked at the unconscious bias that is brought to the forefront. So thank you, the National Association of Realtors for that. Lori, there's a question for you since you worked on an estate realtor association, how do you feel about the state of Michigan promoting diversity within regulated occupations such as appraisers, real estate agents and brokers? Well, of course, I can't speak specifically to any actions um, that have been um, taken or are undergoing because I'm not aware of them. But I would say overall, um, we're hugely supportive of uh, diversity within all of the aspects of the real estate industry. Um, you know, I mentioned before that appraisers are 97% white. I think um, only about 6% of realtors are, um, are black, I think. Um, and so that's, you know, some of those disparities and it's, you know, 13% of the population. So it's really important that um, the real estate industry reflect the communities and the demographics of, of, the, of the areas that they're serving. Thank you. I want to pivot to sellers now. There's a question about, uh, we have low inventory, so it's a seller's market, and sellers can refuse certain financing terms, such as FHA and VA. What are your thoughts, panelists, about the, the seller's ability to limit accepting certain finance terms? Who wants to take a step? That's today? really interesting. So that's something that we're looking at um, at NAFA because I'm hearing that, you know, across the country that um, it's become challenging for users of down payment assistance, for FHA, VA, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and in some cases, just flat out um, a seller saying, you know, we will not accept these types of financing. Um, in the state of Maryland, where I live, source of income is a protected class. And so the Fair Housing Center um, there in Maryland is doing a lot of work and testing right now um, in, in source of income. Um, so I, you know, I would love to see some efforts be made for source of income to be protected um, on a federal basis. Thank you. Let's pivot to uh, recid recidivism. Can I say one thing real quick? Absolutely. Uh, our office is working with um, 
Oakland County Commissioner Cavell and um, others to get source of income adapted. And we're doing it kind of at the grassroots level going up, getting cities, villages, and townships to adapt it. And our office had prepared uh, model ordinances, a couple versions of it. And it does expressly include veterans, VA loans and FHA loans as part of source of income. The, the, uh, up to right now, currently 20 states have adopted it. Two of them have kind of limited protection for section eight from a court decision and by statute. Um, but there's a growing number of Michigan cities, villages, and townships that have adopted it. So that will go a long way to addressing that problem. But that is a real problem um, with sellers because they can dictate the terms that they will not accept that type of finance. Thank you. There are two communities that the audience have, uh, have uh, questions about. The first is there's a high rate of recidivism among those returning citizens who aren't able to secure stability in housing and employment due to their status. When do you think they would be and could they be added to um, as a federally protected class? And the next part of that question is, and when do you think sexual preference will be added as a federal protected class? Don't all jump at the same time now. Well, I, I don't know that I wanna to touch the first one. Okay. Um, but just for clarification, it was that in regard to um, like rehabilitated felons or expats coming back? So that would be, and I'm just going to garner that they are referring to uh, ex or ex-cons coming back into the community. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to touch that. Okay. Well, you want to touch the second part of it? I mean, on that one, HUD, uh, Office of General Counsel did a policy on um, discrimination, disparate, largely disparate, in fact, discrimination against people with a criminal record. And so that's really good guidance that's relied upon by a lot of the courts. So Office of General Counsel guidance 2016 will deal with that. Um, the statistics, I think in Michigan or nationwide, one 33% of black males have a felony record. And so it's far lower. It's also pretty high among Hispanics as well. But if there's a flat criminal record policy without taking doing individualized determination, like for example, no felony in the last 10 years, that's gonna have a disproportionate adverse impact on African-American community and that would violate disparate impact requirements. That would be discrimination. So that is already has some measure of protection. I haven't seen a real thrust to get criminal record, person with a criminal record added as a protected class. Um, it may happen at some point, but I, I think that's down the road. I think source of income is probably the, the one that's really pressing right now. Ryan would, advocate for some other ones as well. Um, but those, you don't have discrimination until you have a protected class. So the battle really is all about protected class. Unless the situation is tied to a protected class, there is no discrimination case, no discrimination claim, no discrimination relief. So that's, so they're really important questions to say, hey, what do we want to include as a protected class? That's a good discussion to have. Thank you so much. Give our panelists a round of applause. They have been amazing. What a day of learning it has been. And we are grateful to all of our speakers who've come from out of town to educate us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have reached a point where we can have some fun. Because it's been some heavy content shared today. So let's have a little fun. We have some prizes. And our own Hannah Deacon will serve as Vanna Wright today. And so if you can answer these questions, and don't worry, virtual participants, we also have a question for you. Uh, before our in-person questions, can anyone is... Is there anyone here who was born on April 11th? Yay! Come on down at the end, we have a we have a prize for you. Yes. So at the end, you can come down, take a picture. And do we have another? We got one online too. We have one online, April 11th, birthday. Awesome, a few people. Awesome, okay. So at the end. <laughs> 
birthday. Exactly. So at the end, we'll invite you up to stage to get your, your prize. The next question, and if you've won one prize, please give the rest of the participants an opportunity to win. Uh, first person to know why we selected April 11th as the date. First hand I Ding, 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 ding. We got ourselves a winner. Give them a round of applause. Our next prize goes to the first virtual participant. So if you were the first to log on to this amazing program, we will send you your prize via mail. Next, prize to the participant who drove the furthest distance to get here. Who came from the furthest distance? Whether you drove or flew in, who came from the furthest distance? Well, I guess the panelists don't count. Does the panelists count, guys? I don't know. Do you want some? Let's throw them in just for yeah. fun. Okay. Furthest distance. Where was it? The airport? You flew in? Oh, okay. Okay. Someone drove in from the airport. Celine, Michigan. Brighton. Okay, let's Google which one's further, Celine or Brighton. Monroe County, that's pretty far. Okay, looks like Monroe County probably won that one, but we'll map it and the last prize, Monroe. who? Monroe County, give it up for Monroe County. Thank you for joining us. And then our last prize is, who can name all of the federal protected classes? Who wants to give it a try? If you're brave enough to give it a try, we've got a great inexpensive prize for you. <laughs> Come on, don't all jump up at once. I know somebody can do it. This will include panelists as well. Are we Googling? No Google. Cool, right? <laughs> all right, we've got a brave soul. I'm not brave. Okay. <laughs> all right, she's the winner. We got a winner, thank you so much. We are very thankful for our event sponsors, Chase Bank, Greater Realtors Foundation, Michigan First Mortgage and US Bank. Give them a big round of applause. This program would not be possible without you. And furthermore, let us give a big round of applause to the GMAR staff, Vicki Livernoy is our executive director and our esteemed president, Terry Spiro. Thank you for your support. Please stand. GMAR staff, would you also stand? These are the hardworking individuals that are greater realtors. And we would also like to acknowledge our affiliate sponsors that provide support for our major events throughout the year. Thank you to our platinum and gold affiliate members. We cannot thank you enough for your continued support. Don't forget participants, please do not forget to stop by the various organizations booths outside on your way to lunch. They love to share information with you about fair housing initiatives that they are working on and how you, you can continue to be a fair housing ally. Thank you so much for your time today. We are fair housing allies. So give yourselves a big round of applause. Lunch is served at this time, and please do not forget to complete your green slip for your CE credit and give it to a GMAR staff member at the check-in tables. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jay Sanders. Let's go turn this knowledge into action. Enjoy lunch.
any prizes, if you're a prize winner, just take a minute to come on up. And if we could get a photo of our panelists, that'd be great. Any GMAR leadership or Michigan Realtors leadership, we'd love to have a quick photo. Absolutely. We're discriminating from the seller. Well, I am a winner, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Winners! Yay! I have multiple size shirts, hats, tops. We have Jeff Hall, Jeff Hall, we have a large, I think it's large. Who wants a large shirt? Yeah. Sure. In the process of having a large Thank you so much for participating. We're going to have you guys come up. Um, Hi. Hi, Alicia. Hi. 